Hello again, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the MarquetteHoops.com basketball show with John Dodds. He makes it all happen on this show. And our producer, Jason Ruck, I'm Tom Pippas. We're brought to you by Moonlight Graham, modern dental benefits. Moonlight Graham, a proud sponsor of this program. Couldn't do it without Craig Caston with us for another year. And Craig, we really appreciate you. Take us right in quickly to our guest because you came up with another great one. Well, great, Pip, and I can speak for the entire market fan base uh, saying that we're very happy you're back from assignment. <laughs> today, we, today we have Tony Smith, uh, one of the all-time great market players, probably top 10 all-time. Um, he was a uh, uh, professional uh, NBA player after he left Marquette, and now he broadcasts. Does a great job. He's become George Thompson-like and uh, w working with Homer, kind of has the insight and a feel, the intuitive feel that George Thompson uh, did. He's a big friend of the program. He talks to the players, tries to make suggestions whenever possible. Uh, big asset to the program. We're going to talk Marquette basketball, J.D. What an amazing season. That's why we're fortunate to have T. Smith here. So why don't you fire away from outside for Tony? Sure. We're, uh, before there was Marcus Howard and before there was Dwayne Wade, there was Tony Smith. And we'll get into his career in a little bit. But first, I want to talk uh, really about this past season. It's just a, an amazing season. 29 wins, most in, in the history. Their banquet was uh, last night as we taped. And uh, the, the awards, Tyler Kolick, uh, Player of the Year in the Big East, MVP of the tournament. I mean, just uh, David Joplin, the uh, uh, Sixth Man of the Year award. It just uh, was a terrific season. And... Uh, Tony, I wanted to get your thoughts on it. We talked a little bit after the Michigan State game, but uh, we watched UConn go all the way to the championship game. And when I looked at that, I thought, college basketball is matchups, and Marquette actually matched up probably better against UConn than a lot of the teams. Yeah, it, first of all, it was an amazing season. Uh, you talked about some of the accolades with Tyler Kolick uh, winning those individual accolades, uh, Kolick and then Shaka Smart winning uh, the coach of the year. So they had a lot of uh, good going around this program uh, last season, winning the regular season title, and then doubling down and, and going through the gauntlet of the Big East tournament and coming out on top of that. So it was an incredible season. There's no question about that. And uh, there's a lot to like about this team. And, yeah, they fell short against the Michigan State team, but just one of those things where, I mean, you have to play at such a high level for such a long time, and if you falter, even a little bit at the wrong time. And even that Michigan State game, they had opportunities to win that game. Uh, I felt like there's a lot of times where Michigan State was actually trying to give them the game, trying to let them back in it. Uh, they just couldn't make enough plays to get themselves back in the ball game. And, uh, you know, I'm sure they're going to look at that game and they're going to feel like, man, we, we let one get away. We could have had that game. But uh, that's how it goes in sports. So you got to, you know, pick yourself up. Uh, get back in the gym right away and, and get back to work and try not to let it happen again. And, and that's how it goes. As a point guard, uh, as you know, you have to bring it on every play. And when you have a bad game or a tough game, and Tyler Kolick was impaired. He, his thumb wasn't healthy, and he looked out of sorts. His passes weren't as crisp. He wasn't as aggressive against uh, Michigan State. But you can't hide when you're a point guard. You can't go off and hide underneath the basket or whatever, you're in charge of the the uh, the rock on every possession. Yeah, I think, uh, Tyler, you know, players don't want to make an excuse like, oh, I was hurt because at the end of the day, if I'm hurt, I shouldn't be out there, right? So, and who doesn't want to be out there? They want to be out there. You want to try to help your team because you feel in your mind that, listen, I could still help this team win. And so you want to get out there and play. And that's uh, exactly what Tyler did. And I, for those of us who've watched Marquette, we, we know that he was impaired because he's not making the same plays that he typically makes. He's not as aggressive. I mean, uh, it's it was similar to looking like last year's Tyler Kolick where he wasn't aggressive to shoot. He was just uh, trying to be much more of a passer. And we saw that transformation this year, which is one of the big reasons Marquette turned the corner in such a big way was that Tyler Kolick, now not only a facilitator and a great passer, now the guy's scoring and, and putting numbers up uh, on the board. So... Uh, he's a very difficult cover in that sense, and you just didn't see much of that in that Michigan State game. Tony, I, I asked Homer, our friend among the three of us, 
did Shaka just coach this team to a higher level? Uh, they just don't seem to have the same kind of players that those who go deep. But as John mentioned, the national champion is Connecticut, and the Golden Eagles beat them twice. So, But he said to me it really comes down to Kolick not being able to be himself. He apologized to his teammates in, in the locker room. It's not fair, I know, to put everything on one person. But if he plays up to his capacity, maybe Marquette goes again from a team picked in preseason to finish at or near the bottom of the conference to some were predicting they get to the, the championship game. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Tyler Kolick being Tyler Kolick, that he was the biggest player of the year uh, in that Michigan State game. That game probably ends differently. Uh, but to your initial question, uh, you know, Shaka, you know, he did he did something incredible with this team. Again, you look at this team and uh, they're, not, they're not full of first-round draft choices, uh, guys that are headed for the NBA and for, for stardom next year. Uh, they're a bunch of guys who believe in what Shaka is telling them and playing the way Shaka wants them to play. And early in the season, it proved to work. And that's where you get buy-in from players. When you're successful at doing what the coach says and you win, that that gives you a lot of belief in the system of what the coach is telling you. And this year they hung their hat on defense. They weren't great offensively. They are efficient offensively, but they weren't great. They were explosive in spurts, but they would also go through droughts uh, where they couldn't score the basketball. And defense kept them in ball games until their offense was able to come back around uh, and score and win those games. So, uh, And that's what Shaka was preaching. I mean, he always preached defense. Every time we talked to him, it's defense, defense, defense. And we, we started to talk to players later in the season. That's the same thing they were saying. Hey, we're a defensive first team. No matter what our offensive numbers say and how efficient we are, how many points we score, we're a defensive-minded team. I thought against UConn, one of the reasons why they were successful is surprisingly they were able to match up against UConn because UConn's, if they had a flaw, and John, John Fanta pointed that out when he was on our show in February, he thought the flaw was the guard spot. And uh, Newton, he played terrific uh, that entire uh, NCAA, but Marquette presses him. And by the time he gets the ball up over half court, there's about 18 seconds left on the shot clock. And they look at Hawkins, that's their first option. And um, Omax is there, Omax Prosper is there to make his life miserable. And then there's Sonogo inside, and Marquette really had no answer for Sonogo. Nobody did. <laughs> nobody, nobody did. Yeah, but right. it seemed like those three guys that killed the NCAA opponents were uh, Calcaterra, Caravan and Jackson and those guys there's not enough time when they play Marquette to do something in the half court with those guys what, what, what was your thought on that Tony yeah the you know the, the UConn obviously what, what I thought when I watched uh, UConn march through the tournament uh, first of all I wasn't shocked uh, I don't often do brackets but I did one for uh, for work for at, over at Good Karma and uh, I had uh I had UConn in my final four, so I, I kind of felt they were going deep because even the game we beat them in the tournament, uh, they played well and they played. They, I mean, they blew Marquette out that second game uh, when they wanted revenge and they were they were mad and they came out. And that was the only team that that ever did that the entire season. So I knew that they had something. They had the pieces and and like John was saying, you know, they have uh, a, a sort of a weakness. I'll call it a sort of a weakness, John, at the point position with Newton. Because Newton did also hurt Marquette and, and, and a couple of those games. Uh, but he was also shut down in one of those games. And I saw the same thing versus San Diego State. And they were pressuring him big time. And it was causing him a lot of problems. Got the ball stolen a couple of times. Uh, made some bad passes. So uh, that was their weakness because he's not one of those little small, quick, twitchy guards, right? So a little quick guard can give him problems. Stevie Mitchell gave him headaches, right? But he gave a lot of people headaches. <laughs> but mm -hmm. he, he gave Newton... Uh, uh, headaches and like you say you waste nine seconds getting the ball over over the half court now you don't have a lot of time to run your offense but listen UConn is super talented uh, but I but I felt like you know if anything for the Marquette players that just shows how close you are uh, to reaching that that ultimate goal I mean the team that won it you beat them twice and it wasn't a fluke that you beat them you beat them twice good so uh, that that's what I took from those UConn games Shaka mentioned last night at the banquet that his favorite game of the year 
was the win at Creighton. He thought that the win at Creighton, uh, they were invested in defense for 40 minutes. Their offense came alive later, and they came back and won it at the end. But he was most proud of that game with 19,000 fans screaming at him. And uh, everyone else was saying, no, it was the UConn game in New York City. That was the, the high point of the year. What are your thoughts on, on that uh, comparison? Yeah, there. I mean, there are a lot of great games. Obviously, they they won twenty nine games, so uh, there were there was there were some good ones in there. The the Baylor victory. Uh, there was the uh, even the game they lost at Purdue. I, I thought they played a good game. They could have won that game. Uh, you know, Purdue's big guy just took over, and that was the the one weakness of Marquette. But they were able to handle uh, another big guy uh, for for UConn because when Snogo wasn't really effective uh, in that first game, they took him out. And here comes Klingon, and this guy was really putting a hurt on Marquette. So uh, they had to kind of figure it out. I just like about this team, John uh, and Pip, their ability to kind of figure it out. Uh, people would ask me about these guys during the season. I would say, listen, man, these guys, to me, they're like Jason from Friday the 13th, right? It doesn't matter what – you can run, you can sprint, you can jump in the car and get off, but they're going to track you down, and they're just going to do it by walking. They're not going to – not going to run you down. They're going to walk you down. And that's all they do. They just continue to keep coming and coming and coming. Uh, and they were able to do that uh, mostly throughout the year. And obviously a few games uh, didn't work out for them, but it wasn't for a lack of trying. And you and you always got a good effort. Like I said, that one UConn game all year, and I'm talking one game out of uh, 30-some games they played that, you know, that they actually got beat pretty handily. How big a jump did Osa make in your estimation uh, boy he's a he's a really great passer isn't he yeah yeah he's 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 phenomenal he's a, a unique talent i think uh one of the reasons that uh, teams kind of had problems with marquette because they, they know he's not going to shoot from the outside but they don't understand how to how to play him then because like okay i don't have to guard him out there so i can stand back but uh he's just looking to pass so now you're just giving him free passing lanes a good passer you don't you want to get hands in his face you want to bother him uh, and you got to be up on him to do that, right? So when teams sit back on him, he's just easy, free pass and sitting there, and, he's, and he will pick you apart because he is an excellent passer. And guys understand that with he and both Kolick, uh, when they have the ball, uh, you understand that you better move and because they're going to hit you if you're open. And, you know, I, I learned the same thing playing with Magic. I mean, I see in practice, you know, you better move when he's got the ball run because he's going to find you if you can get open and find the seat. Yeah, great point. Yeah, and and to Oso Igadara, get good, clever moves around the basket. I think he's silky smooth in that regard. Yeah, yeah, yeah he got better offensively as well. Yep. Yeah, we're gonna say the same thing about a lot of these guys, right? When we talk about them, that the the improvement from last year to this year uh, was dramatic, and it was it was obviously uh, visible with most of these guys, and that's why they were able to elevate the way that they did. And and also, uh, he's gonna have to continue to evolve his offensive game, uh, put more tools in his bag. Um, as John said, he has the, the jump hooks, the little touch floater shots in the paint. Uh, at some point, he's going to have to get an elbow jumper, a free throw line jump shot. Uh, and if he does that, uh, he's going to become even more dangerous. I, I don't think he needs to, to be uh, turned into a stretch four or stretch five by any means, but he certainly has to be able to hit that, that free throw elbow shot that's available because right now his option is to, you know, he has to dribble into the defense now to get that floater off. He can't just take... Uh, what's open and available at the elbow uh, because he's not comfortable with that shot yet. Obviously, they have Kolek who's going to work off the pick and roll, but the, the problem with Oso, if you you know, you know you don't want to come out and guard him like teams are not going to, they're going to sit back uh, because he's not going to shoot that shot out there. Uh, then you get you get him doing handoffs, uh, and handoffs are become an issue because now it's two-on-one against your point guard, and Oso's going to pick him off. Now you got Tyler uh, coming downhill, at your big right and drawing uh, some attention in, and that's when it's not only he's not going to necessarily shoot a floater or score a layup every time over the big, but he's going to draw traffic right now. He's going to kick out to the shooters right. You got Joplin, uh, you got Omax slashing. Uh, you just have a guy sitting on the perimeter, Stevie Mitchell. Uh, you know he's a slasher. Uh, you got Cam Jones out there. You don't want to leave him open. So uh, Marquette becomes very dangerous when you allow Kolek to get into the paint because he's such a great passer and. Yeah. By not guarding Oso, you're giving your you give you putting your guard at a at a big disadvantage, a two on one. Uh, so most teams sometimes you got to bring that the big up there to help out 
on that pick and roll to kind of slow down Kolick. Tony, you mentioned earlier it takes that trained eye to appreciate a player such as Stevie Mitchell. He's not going to the next level, but you don't win without a guy like that, do you? He just seems to be the glue, particularly, as you point out, hounding people on D. Yeah, uh, you know, when I think of good teams, Pip, I think of teams that have all the bases covered as far as what you might need in a basketball game. And Stephen Mitchell certainly uh, fills one of those needs, and that need is to pressure the basketball and uh, make the team use up time on their valuable shot clock so they can't get into the offense and get deep into – some of their sets. So Stephen Mitchell will pester you. Uh, he will turn you. He will turn the guard. And then also put some wear and tear on you, right? So you get him, and then you get Sean Jones to come in, and he does the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like having one guy out there for 40 minutes who's able to pressure the point guard position. And uh, me being a point guard myself, I understand how annoying that is when you have a guy that's just all up under you uh, from the time you get the ball in from, from 94 feet away. It's like, give me give me a break, man. Get out of here. So sometimes you see guys... They'll just give the ball up because I don't want to deal with this guy. And again, that disrupts your offense a little bit. And that's that's your role. It's it seems like a small role, but it, it's not. I know people in the basketball game understand that's not a small role and a small thing to do to a team. It's actually uh, a huge factor, and uh, that's what Stevie Mitchell does, and he loves doing it. Yeah. Well, you you did a lot of it yourself at every level, Tony. No question. Uh, I wanted to. You mentioned Cam Jones in that first game, Vermont, right? JD is the recollection yes. of the first tourney game. They were struggling a little bit. The lead had been whittled, and Cam Jones just went, I don't know as I've seen too many Marquette players do that in a game of that magnitude. It was unreal. Everything was going in. What do you have, 18 straight points? Crazy. Yeah, that, that, that Vermont game was uh, was interesting because we, we saw Kolick, uh, uh, That's I believe that's the game he got hurt, and he was out for a bit, and he got right. foul trouble as well. So he's out there, and, and I told Homer during the broadcast, I said, this is going to be good for – for Cam because now he can get involved because he wasn't really involved before that. So he comes back in. Now he's running the point position. He's, he's basically playing the Tyler Kolick position, right? But to me, that meant, okay, he's going to have the ball in his hand now. He's going to be more involved. And uh, apparently that's exactly what it took. It took him to be more engaged and more involved and have the ball in his hands a little bit more uh, to finally start getting some rhythm and getting some feel and uh, we've seen him this guy all year, right? Once he starts making those rainbow shots, man, it, it is it is trouble for the opponent, and he gets hot. Then he starts going to the rim, uh, which he's got uh, much more effective at uh, this year than he was last year, uh, finishing at the rim. So, you know, he's got those two uh, things down. He's got the three-point shot down. He's got the, the finish at the rim down pretty good. Now he just needs to get a mid-range. If he can, you know, not always, you're know, not always able to get to the rim, right? So you got got to have, that mid-range game you see a lot of guys uh a lot of a lot of players in general have gone away from that because they see you know guys shooting up threes like Steph Curry in the NBA but uh if you really dig deep you see the 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 really good guys they have a mid-range game LeBron has a mid-range Kawhi uh KD Devin Booker uh these are elite scorers uh Kyrie Irving these guys have mid-range game they can finish at all three levels uh and that's something Cam I'm sure will be working on and if you see guys like him and Joplin uh, get that mid-range down to go with their three-point shot and mm -hmm. ability to finish at the rim, uh, they become uh, elite at that point. John, I should have mentioned it at the top, although I think most fans watching and listening know that Tony with the homer, of course, Tony is the radio analyst of the Marquette University basketball games. Homer does the play-by-play, -play, and Homer has said to me, Tony sees what's happening. He calls the play before it happens. I mean, that's when you know there's brilliance there, being able to anticipate. I love that. And he'll tell you it's rejuvenated my career. I'm having a ball. <laughs> yeah, Homer. Uh, Homer's, Homer's, Homer's great. I mean, obviously, he's seen a lot of basketball. But again, uh, you, it's just sometimes, Pip, you got to know what, what you're looking for and what's going out there. And obviously, me being out there in those situations helps because I understand like what teams are trying to do or or I watch a player, I see what he wants to do and if he's able to do it or not. So uh, it, I, I love calling the games, obviously. I love watching these uh, these guys play, and uh, this year was especially great. Yeah, I think of the George Thompson feel to you where you, rather than saying what just happened, you're telling Homer or telling the audience what you think is going to happen, or you see something, oh, watch out for this. This might be a, a key where we can exploit. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll always go to a personal experience like, hey, if, if that was me in there, this is what I'd be doing or this is what I'd be thinking, right? Because, uh, you know, you, you get to you get to know the guys. I think at one point I asked Shaka, I asked Shaka, who are your chip on the shoulder guys? Like some of you guys got to have, some guys play better with a chip on their shoulder. Like Tyler Cole is definitely one of those guys. You know, if, if he's hears some talk about him or some chirping about him not being uh, a good player or not being this kind of player, that kind of player, he's a guy that, ooh, I love that he heard that because now he's going to go in the game engaged, right? He's going to be locked in. Uh, not everybody it, are, it can play like that. Not everybody's a, a chip guy. So, you know, little things like that you can notice uh, when there's chirping going on between two guys. You know, I'll tell Homer and say, hey, watch. Uh, watch this guy. Watch that guy. He was going at it with this defender. So it's going to be something interesting in that matchup to happen. So just little stuff. You got to know what to watch for. Uh, but – uh, I enjoy bringing the game to people who are not there to see it. So hopefully I'm doing a good job of explaining what's going on. And uh, I know Homer's doing a good job because he's a, he's a consummate professional. You, you two are fantastic. And you, you can almost picture what's going on. And if I'm listening to a look of this, then Homer will go, it happened just like you said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you mentioned David Joplin before. Um, you talk about David Joplin. On offense, we all know, but on defense, it was it was a, an amazing transformation. Yeah, Joplin is a kid I'm familiar with. He was uh, in in some of my AAU uh, programs and workouts uh, coming up at Brookfield Central. I know his parents very well, so uh, we have some family ties there together. And I, you know, I spoke with with Jop early in, early last season about his defense, John. And I said, "Man, Jop, I said, you're, listen, you're out there, you're watching the game." I said, uh, that's why you're coming out quickly. You know, he would go in there and Shock would have to pull him out because he wasn't on page uh, with the rest of the guys defensively. And uh, I said, it's because you're watching the game. I said, this is not high school. <laughs> this is college, man. You got to be engaged. You got to know what you're doing before you actually have to do it. Uh, you can't be reactionary on defense or you're going to be late. So uh, I had to talk with him. Obviously, he's still a freshman. He's got to work through his, his growing pains, his ups and downs that all freshmen are going to have. And uh, as you say, he came back this year definitely better on the defense end, defensive end. Still, you know, limited. He's not the most athletic uh, player, so he's still limited somewhat defensively. But again, uh, that's when you even have to be more locked in on the game plan and 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 do your work early is is what we call it defensively. Be in the right spot before you got to be there. Anticipate uh, before you actually have to move. Uh, that those are the things that'll get David. Uh, over the hump defensively and, and allow him to play better. And as you said, uh, you know, he is a big body. You don't realize how big he is. Uh, so he was able to play Sonoa. I, listen, I was a little surprised that he was able to handle Sonoa down there, especially with fouls, but uh, it, it shows his competitiveness and it shows his desire. So uh, if you have the desire to get better uh, in the in the system that Shaka has set up with his, with his coaches and their, their development, he's probably going to get better. So I expect... Uh, even better things from dropping the next year on the defensive end. There are no secrets in the Big East. And when Joplin had those eight three pointers against DePaul, where he looked like the second coming of Mark Aguirre, and I still, <laughs> I still say Mark Aguirre's in there somewhere. We just got to get it out of there. <laughs> but um, when you do that in a Big East game, there are no secrets in the Big East. So every time he came in, I could hear an opponent coach say, shooter, shooter. They'd he'd come around to pick, and they'd jump that pick. So even when he wasn't hitting shots, he was creating space, and the fear of those eight shots that he hit against uh, against DePaul, it's, um, it, it was almost worth it. So even though he might have been in a slump or he didn't do that the next uh, 10 games or so, it, it, he sure had impact. Yeah, he did. And shooters are going to draw attention. That's what you do. I mean, as you said, when he comes in the game, similar to when Hawkins comes in for UConn, right? It's like, you know, you got to know where this guy is uh, or Calcaterra, those guys. You got to know where these shooters are because they're going to hurt you if you lose sight of them uh, just for a moment because they get it off quick. Now, uh, Joplin is one of those guys. If he gets hot, uh, you're just asking for trouble. And it's, it's weird how guys, when they get hot, now they always seem to be open. Like, I, that's one thing I never understand <laughs> during the broadcast. I'm like, this guy just hit three threes. How is he still open? Right. Like, I would be just glued to this guy. I wouldn't look at anybody else. But uh, that's what happened. Guys get lost. But, again, the value of uh, guys like uh, Tyler Coley, guys like Oso, who can collapse the defense for you. And you as a shooter, you have to have the ability to find the open seams and, 
and be visible to those guys so they can hit you with passes. And uh, again, Joplin's he's got a long way to go. I think he's got a huge upside still to go, which is a good thing for Marquette. So he's got to continue to work, uh, get in the gym, and 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 develop his craft again. Like like I said, with if him and Cam Jones figure out how to get a mid range game, uh, if both of them do it at the same time next year, it's going to be lights out. That is really resonating with me, that comment Tony made. If you can get the mid-range, as you point out, all the NBA greats have it, and it makes them that much more difficult to, to guard. You mentioned Sean Jones, there's Ross. I was impressed with these kids playing in spurts. How big a jump do you feel, Tony, from watching them they can make during the offseason and make themselves even better for the campaign to come? Yeah, if they make similar jumps to, to what the sophomores uh, this year did, uh, Man, they're going to be uh, incredible because I thought, obviously, Sean Jones. We saw this guy is fearless, right? He's five foot nothing, but he <laughs> he, he thinks. I think in his mind, I think he's like six eight because the way he attacks the rim, uh, he goes after. He doesn't care who's in there. There could be a seven footer in there. He's going to attack the rim. He's going to try to hit the body. Uh, he's going to try to finish, and he does not care. So he's fearless in, in that in that uh, regard, but. Uh, I tell you what, Chase Ross has has an opportunity with this athletic ability, man, to to be unbelievable. Uh, he just has to again figure it out. It's, it's always an adjustment, right? When you're coming here, you're playing in the Big East. The Big East is no slouch, right? They just won the the national championship. They had uh, a couple teams with deep runs. You had uh, Xavier down there in, in a deep run. Creighton uh, had a, had a good run. So uh, the the Big East is tough. So for those guys to go through that gauntlet, learn some stuff. Uh, I think it's going to do wonders with them. And then obviously don't forget they're, they're practicing against the Big East player of the year, <laughs> the Big East six man of the year. Uh, also, they're, they're practicing against these, these very good players as well. So that's going to help their development. And uh, I expect, you know, a, a, a normal jump. I'm not going to expect anything extraordinary as far as their uh, a jump in their, their play, but I would expect them to play uh, better than they did last year for sure. How much better? It just remains to be seen. We use that word great often, but it certainly applies to Tony Smith on the court, in the broadcast booth, most important as a person. Really appreciate his time. Well, John Dodds, this has been a marvelous experience. Again, another MarquetteHoops.com basketball show brought to you by Moonlight Graham, Modern Dental Benefits. Moonlight Graham is a proud sponsor. We're grateful for Craig Casson. You have a website, too, I think a lot of fans know about. Maybe some don't. Sure. MarquetteHoops.com. It's part of the uh, CBS 24-7 digital network. If you go into the left-hand column, you'll see at the top all these shows that we have are archived on YouTube. If you can send those to Market fans, we'd appreciate it. And also, you can uh, sign up for our free newsletter just below that right there. Just drop your email address in that widget. And sometimes it takes twice, two times to do it but uh, we'll, we'll keep you informed as to updates uh, in market basketball. My bias notwithstanding, it is outstanding. It's obviously a wonderful time to be a Marquette basketball fan. For JD, for Jason, I'm Pip. Take care, everybody. Go Golden Eagles, and God bless. We'll see you next time.